Hello, everybody. <clears throat> okay. Um, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Bob. I really enjoyed that session. Um, I don't know about you, but whenever I watch Bob doing science experiments, it sort of feels a bit like watching a magician. <laughs> I never know quite what to expect. <laughs> so, we have reached the final of our three Macmillan International Education sessions for the morning. And as I said at the beginning of my first session, I would talk about decoding later. And of course, that is what we are about to do. So let me just double check if everyone is back in their seats. Um, if you are back in your seat, can you type in the box your favourite English word, please? What is your favourite word? in the English language. I'm going to type my, oh, please, that's a nice word. I'm going to type mine. There it is. Lugubrious. I love that word. It's one of my favourite. Thanks. Oh, empathy is a beautiful word. I like imagination too. <laughs> Unfathomable is a great word to say as well. Oh, rainbow. You're all such positive people. These are such positive words. Ooh, poignant. That's a nice word. Insight. Cruckle. Oh, engagement. Marvellous. OK, these are some lovely, lovely, lovely English words. Good to see you are all still alive and well and happy at the other end of the computer. Epiphany is a great word. It's fun to say, isn't it? Epiphany. Epiphany. Hmm. OK, so our final session is all about synthetic phonics and I remember from my trip to Argentina last year that there is a huge love for phonics in the environment around you. So I'm sure some of you will be expert phonics teachers and I'm sure that one or two of you will still have some questions out there that need some answers. Um, during this session Please do share your ideas, your hints and your tricks and your tips along with mine, uh, because if there is one thing we know about teaching, stealing as a teacher is a good thing. And I always encourage teachers to steal my ideas, each other's ideas. As Veronica says, it keeps us updated and avoids us getting rusty. And that is very, very important. Um, Echoing, echoing back to Bob's point, as a teacher, our job is to be a lifelong student. And that is so, 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 so true, whatever subject we teach. So, practical tips for synthetic phonics. We're going to start with a little bit of a spelling bee. So, I am going to give you four English words. I would like you ooh, to type those four words in the box. Um, Reiner, just to say, I don't have control of my slides at the moment. I don't know why, but we don't need that. Ooh, there we go. Maybe it was just being slow. There we are. Um, OK, so. Right, I'm going to give you four words. What I would like you to do is just simply type the word in the box. I will say the word. I will give you a single sentence that demonstrates the word. Then you type it in the box. Nice and easy. OK. Uh, word number one is two. I can see two birds sitting in the tree. Told you it was nice and easy. Get, get, we can all spell the number two. Brilliant. Our second word, our second word is late. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm late. <laughs> there is your sentence. Okay, brilliant, good, excellent. No challenges there. Now, our third word, 
<laughs> Don't be nervous, Veronica. I have every faith that you can spell these words. They are definitely primary level English words. <gasps> Our third word is the word circus. The acrobats at the circus swung high in the air. Brilliant. Good. No challenges there. All right. Now, our final word is the word segue. The DJ had a cool segue to link the ideas. Hmm. Now, this is going to be interesting because I predict that most of you will get this wrong, but I think a few of you will get it right as well. And we will come back to that in a minute. Okay, um, Reiner, I, I might need to give you a little thumbs up symbol and let you click the slides because it's not giving me control. So, yes. <laughs> uh, audience members, if you see me doing this, it's a special secret signal to my wonderful assistant, Reiner. Okay, so our session is going to take this form. I'm going to start by assessing why phonics matters, why phonics has become such a big deal, not only in first language acquisition, but also in second, third, fourth language acquisition. Whether you are bilingual, whether you are learning English as a second language, whether you're learning as a foreign language, the chances are if you are a kid, you have been introduced to phonics at this stage. We're then going to be looking at the process of phonics and why things are set up in the way they are. And we're going to be looking at some different ways to enable us to learn sounds and letters, to master reading and writing, and of course, to get the most out of those decodable readers, setting us on a lifelong path to reading. See if it's going to work. Yay, there we go. All right, so here are the answers to the questions. And as I predicted, we have a couple of correct answers for the final word, but a lot of wrong ones. But let's start by thinking about these words one by one. What makes them difficult to spell? The first word, two. What's difficult about spelling two? Why might it be confusing or complicated to somebody that's first seeing this word written down? It's that silent W, isn't it? And especially, as Maria points out, if we've got no context for it, it could be one of three words. We've also got T double O and T single O as well as T W O. So we've got different spelling options and we've got a silent letter. There's challenge number one. All right, what about the second word? What might make late difficult to spell? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of typing happening. Let's see what we come up with. Why might late be a difficult word? Ah, yes. Vivian, <laughs> the silent E, the magic E, as it was called when I was in school. Um, the magic E, which makes that vowel sound much longer. It changes that A, it makes it different, as Georgina says, from the A in apple. It's not an A ah sound. The magic E on the end makes it much longer and it turns it into an a sound. Now, in the chat box, any ideas how many different ways there are to write the A sound? What can you think of? How many can you come up with? How many different representations are there for the A sound, if you had to guess? What do we think? What do we think? Hmm. Oh, yep. Yeah. There's an AI. Absolutely. As in rain. Good. Ah, there's EI as in eight. Indeed, there is. AY as in pay. Good. Um, aha. Yes. AIGH. Excellent. And EIGH. Indeed. 
A Y E Y. In total, we can write the A sound in English, that A sound, in seven different ways. So, of course, one of those being the silent E on the end after the A, like in name or shame or plain or plate. But, of course, there are also six other alternatives. So, as a child, hearing the word for late the first time. How do you know how to write that? You're going to have to make a guess. You're going to have to make a guess. There's a lot of options. Our next word, circus, what makes that one difficult then? How do we, how do we deal with this? Hmm. Hmm. What's the troublemaker in here? Ah, maybe they are. Indeed, I can see a bigger, more immediate problem though. What makes, well, what's this one? Mm -mm -mm. Yep, that uh sound can be quite complicated. Ah, yes, the C. There we go. There we go. It's the C, isn't it? This letter, this one letter in this word is doing two completely different jobs. At the beginning, it's making a s sound like an S should make. In the middle, it's making a hard K sound, like a kicking K, as it used to be called when I was in school. So we've got one letter doing two different jobs, making two different sounds in the same word. All right, final one then. What makes segue difficult to spell? <laughs> and the people that got this right I am pretty certain you can tell me the exact answer for why this is difficult in English. All of it, says, uh, says Rosalina. Yes, all of it, says Paula. All of it makes it difficult. Where are we going? Actually, the seg at the beginning is not too bad. We all got that right. It's the end of that word, isn't it? When does U-E make a way sound in English? It doesn't. And why? Because it's a foreign word. English as a language is full of loan words. We say loan words. Realistically, they might be words we stole. Um, I don't think we gave anyone a choice. We just took them. But it's an Italian word. It's not an English word. So segue, personally, to me, I learned how to spell this word probably about five years ago. Um, I spent 35 years not knowing how to spell this word. I had seen the word written down. I understood the meaning of it, but I always thought it was pronounced Sieg. <laughs> I'd heard the word, but I always presumed that was spelt S-E-G-W-A-Y, and I never made the connection between those two words being the same word until about five years ago. English is a difficult language to learn, to read and write. Um, structurally, it's, it's not too much different from many other languages. Um, subject, verb, object, we can pretty much handle that. There's a pattern. 90% of the time we stick to that pattern. But where we just go crazy is the spelling. It, <laughs> I'm glad you're taking some comfort in this, Paula. Um, it, it's a really, really, really difficult language to learn to read and write which is why phonics was developed. Phonics was not developed for people in an international context. Phonics was developed to help native speakers learn to read and write our crazy language. In English, can anyone tell me how many individual sounds are there? We've got, we've got a very clear total of sounds in English. Anybody know how many individual sounds there are in the English language? Give you a clue. It's more than the number of letters in the alphabet. 44. Bang on, Analia. Well done. Look at that. Um, 44 is the exact correct answer. English has 44 unique sounds. 
How many letters in the English alphabet? Anyone know? I hope so. It's not a, it, it, I promise it's not a trick question. It's 26, there we go. <laughs> Room full of teachers on a Saturday morning and we've forgotten how many letters there are in the English language. It's 26, promise. It's definitely 26. You can count them all after. I, I will allow you that time. So, anyone see a problem? 26 letters, 44 sounds. Already, we know we're going to need to make some connections between letters to create enough ways to make 44 sounds. But of course, in English, we make life as difficult as we possibly can. We took 44 sounds and we decided the best idea was to have approximately 126 identifiable ways of writing those 44 sounds. So we took our 26 letters, we needed 44 sounds, we came up with 120 plus combinations. I am very, very sorry. I am very <laughs> sorry for my people. But as Paula says, that, that is exactly where the beauty of English lies. And that's what makes it, it so much fun to play with. There's so many things that we can do. Um, and it, it, in, in some ways, once you've mastered it, it becomes a really fun language to play with. But yes, 120 plus different ways of writing, or as we refer to them in phonics, graphemes. So what are we going to do with our session? Right up. <laughs> Thank you. This is why phonics is here. Um, this is a statement from the UK Department for Education back in 2010, so from 10 years ago. And in answer to the question of why is phonics part of our national curriculum, they, had, they made a statement stating that the evidence is clear. The teaching of systematic synthetic phonics is the most effective way of teaching young children to read, especially those at risk of having problems with reading. Now, keywords here, systematic synthetic phonics. Um, as many of you probably are aware, there are some different types of phonics out there. We have embedded phonics, which teaches phonics as part of a wider English language course. Um, we have analytic phonics, which is basically about analysing individual words, which is helpful, but causes often holes in the foundations. There are cracks. Um, when, we, when we experience phonics through the um, analytic form, it, it, it's a bit haphazard, whereas synthetic phonics is systematic. And this is why within the UK and within many other countries as well, the synthetic phonics process is the most important. They take synthetic phonics because synthetic phonics follows a process. And we will have a look at that process. Now, what makes oop, synthetic phonics so much better? It covers a certain number of things. Eee, sorry, Rhino. I'm making Rhino's life so difficult today. There we go. So, within a synthetic phonics program, and many of you, if you are using phonics in your schools currently, you are probably using a synthetic phonics program. Why? Because it A, makes sure they introduce all of the phonemes of the English language. All 44 sounds will be covered in a synthetic phonics program. We also, within a synthetic phonics program, introduce children to those graphemes, those 120 plus graphemes that we can identify within English spelling. 
that represent those 44 sounds. The key thing to remember about a synthetic phonics program is that it does everything, but it does everything in a systematic cumulative order. We don't teach phonics alphabetically when we're using a systematic synthetic approach. We teach by order of frequency and complexity. So a synthetic phonics program, um, for those of you that do teach phonics and do use synthetic phonics programs, what is always the first sound letter combination that you learn in a phonics program? Da, 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 da. Anyone get it? Let's see. Give me one single letter. There it is, Marianella straight in. It is an S. Um, synthetic phonics is often referred to as sat pin. Um, and that is because that's the order that we start to learn. So we take the grapheme and the phoneme combination that is the most frequently, most widely used. There we go, sat pin, S-A-T-P-I-N. And those six letters and sounds right there are some of the easiest to identify and the most useful to learn. So in a synthetic phonics program, we start from high frequency, common grapheme representations for phonemes. We then move through in a systematic order, building on the knowledge that comes. It's incredibly logical. And if we think back to what the Department for Education Center, uh, said, it's because of this that we're building those blocks up. It is the systematic synthetic approach that is the most effective because of this. Now, because we're talking about the English language, obviously there are problems, there are difficulties. So with synthetic phonics, we are of course learning how to blend or connect phonemes together in words to be able to read them and to understand them, but we are also learning how to segment those phonemes to break a word down into its little constituent parts, its individual sounds to be able to spell that word. Aside from blending and segmenting, a good solid synthetic phonics program will encourage children to recognize, notice, identify that phonemes in English, the sounds of English, are represented in multiple ways. <laughs> As we said, with the sound A, that's seven different ways. They're not all quite that excessive. But a phoneme, for example, the s sound might be represented by the grapheme s. It might be represented by a double s, ss, like at the end of mess. Or just to be a bit crazy, we could write a c, and that could be an s. It could also be a ts, but we're not going to teach them that grapheme because that is very, very low frequency and it's also stolen from another language. So we teach them that one sound might have many different ways to write it. Some ways of writing might be one single letter. Sometimes it might be groups of two letters. It could be as many as four letters together to make one sound. On the flip side of that, we also teach that some of the graphemes in English, like the grapheme C, have different jobs to do. So sometimes the same grapheme might make a different sound. It might have an alternative pronunciation. And because a synthetic phonics program takes these points and drills them home, what we're essentially doing is enabling children to have all of those foundational building blocks that they need to become the fluent readers that we talked about earlier. If you remember, it said very clearly in that slide in my first session that the first step to reading fluency and reading skills is decoding. So how do we do this? Let's have a look. Um, what I think is a key point to remember now at this stage in this talk 
is that phonics was designed for native speakers and synthetic phonics was designed for native speakers. It is something that was developed for native speakers that has been adopted internationally. It was found in international schools that run British curriculums, some of which I'm sure are represented here. It became um, more and more popular in bilingual schools. And it's also now in language education, straight up second, third, fourth language acquisition for children, see synthetic phonics in part of its makeup. Because it was designed for native speakers, one of the biggest criticisms in an international context is a lack of, um, well, let's, no, let's take lack of out. It's a presumption within phonics that people understand the words that are happening. And of course, the reality in an international context is that often synthetic phonics is being taught at the same time that language acquisition is happening. So most importantly, in an international context, in a bilingual context, the first stage of acquiring sounds and letters, and Rhino, if I can get you to skip to the next slide, is being able to notice what's happening, raising awareness. Um, how many sounds are there in Spanish? Can anybody tell me what's the number of Spanish sounds that you have? Does anyone know? You might not know. <laughs> I, I don't think I could tell you in any of my, um, my other languages that I don't teach how many sounds there are, but I would be very, very curious. No idea. Yes, no, don't, don't worry. We can all Google it later. Anyone want to Google that now in the chat box? Go right ahead. Um, within, within English, we need to encourage the children to notice that there are 44 sounds. Some of those sounds are very similar to each other. And depending on the mother tongue, 39, thank you very much, Belkis. I appreciate that hugely. There we are. Um, depending on the mother tongue of the child that's studying phonics, those 44 sounds, some of them will be familiar. Some of them will match their mother tongue. Of our 44 sounds in English, some of those will match almost exactly to the sounds of Spanish. However, Spanish has sounds that English does not, and vice versa. So in a bilingual classroom in Argentina, you've got children who are potentially hearing a specific sound individually for the first ever time. They might have heard it as part of words, they might have heard it in conversation, but teaching and learning those individual sounds and letters, this might be the first time that they have focused entirely on the purity of the sound. We also have letters in languages that do not transfer. <laughs> so, um, of course, you know, in, in, in Espanol, there is the, the N with the hat on. I'm sure it has a name. This is not a letter in my language in English um, and vice versa. We have letters in English, which I'm sure potentially you don't have in Spanish. And the same is true for many, many other languages. So within a international or second language bilingual context, the first most important foundational step to learning and teaching phonics is to spend time on noticing. Noticing and spotting and identifying individual sounds within words. How can we do this? Well, of course, step one, emphasis. There is so much that we can do with the power of our voice, um, be it encouraging children to stutter certain words. So when you're, when you're saying and when you're teaching and you're giving example sentences, maybe we're teaching the w 
sound in English. So you might say to the children, w -w -w where is the w -w window? Highlighting, emphasizing, pointing out those initial sounds. Of course, repetition as much as possible, as with everything in young learner education. The more we do it, the better they get. The more we do it, the more they remember. So key points, emphasis and repetition. How do we do this? Well, it's a young learner's classroom, so it should be as fun as it possibly can be. And in that respect, we're going to be using lots and lots of games and lots and lots of chants as much as we can. Let's see what's happening. Let's move on and have a look at a couple of games. Now, um, for, for those of you that are not familiar with it, Macmillan's synthetic phonics program is called Snappy Sounds. Um, just like any other synthetic phonics program, it follows your sat pin trajectory. It takes that full approach. So it's all 44 sounds, over 120 different graphemes to represent them over two years phonics series. What is particularly interesting about it is that it was written and developed for second language learners with second language learners in mind. So whereas many of the first language native speaker synthetic phonics programs don't have much of an emphasis on the noticing aspect and the awareness raising aspect at the very beginning, there's lots and lots of support um, within Snappy Sounds. So a few of my favorite little noticing games and noticing activities, a couple of which I have stolen from the teacher's book of this series. Um, Word Hunt is a great place to start. So we're going to play it now. I'd like you just to take a moment to turn your head, look at the environment around you, take in your room, wherever you are sitting. In the classroom, I would do this as a physical activity, but for many of us, physical activities in the classroom are a thing of history. Um, we now live in a digital world where we teach in a digital world. So we're going to do the digital online version of this. I'm going to give you a sound. I'll make it nice and easy. What I would like you to do when you hear the sound, I would like you to look around your room and the first thing that you see in your room that begins with that sound, I would like you to write in the chat box. If we were in a classroom situation, I'd ask you to pick it up and show it to the camera. But sadly, there are far too many of us in this room to be able to look at the camera. So we're going to do it in the chat box. In the classroom, oral, visual, definitely. When it comes to noticing activities, before we get to the graphemes, when we're introducing the phonemes, don't type. For now, you're going to type. OK, so my first sound. I'd like you to show, tell me the first thing you can see that starts with a b, b, b. And here's mine. There it is. I've got, oh, it wasn't p, that was b, b, b. There we go. All right, look around, look around, look around, look around. There we go. Bottle, book, lots and lots of books. What a surprise. Teachers in rooms with books in them. <laughs> a few more bottles, some boots. Ooh, I've got some boots under my table and that's my ball. Now, key thing that we've just brought up there is the difference between the b and the p. And of course, especially with these plosives, these unvoiced sounds, they can be really, really difficult to hear. With This is why these noticing activities are so, 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 so important. Now, noticing activities, it's important to remember that when we are doing noticing activities, sounds are not always found at the beginning of words. OK, so when you do an activity like word hunt or sound hunt, if you prefer, you can start by practicing with initial sounds. Of course, sounds occur in different positions within a word. So it's important when we're doing these noticing activities that we are noticing sounds 
doing different jobs within a word. So what I would like you to do, I'd like you to look around your room again. And I'd like you to see the first thing that ends, ends with a b sound. So we've had the ones that begin with a b. Let's see whether they end with a b as well. What's the first thing you can see that ends with a b sound? Oh, now, Adriana, here's a question for you. Does comb end with a b sound or a m sound? Remember, we're talking about the sounds here, not the spelling. Now, there we go. Light bulb. Indeed, spider web. They end with a b sound. And of course, activities like this, this is why we have to remember that we are saying and listening and not reading and typing. Because, of course, our students are going to make exactly those um, those little, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say mistakes because they're not mistakes. It's a learning process. But of course, English, we have silent bees, <laughs> lots of them. So yeah, always very, very good. We then also can move that on to finding that sound in the middle of words as well. So can anybody see anything in their room with a b sound in the middle of it? Ooh, 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 ooh. Anyone got something with a b in the middle of it? Anyone? Ah, cupboard. There's a good one. And it's got a nice silent P as well, just to make things see. I have got a photo album next to me. That's got a B in the middle of it, an album. So, um, remembering when we're doing these noticing, take those activities up that one notch. Don't just practice hearing the sound at the beginning of the word, play with its position within the word. Another technique that's quite nice to use is um, once you've done those initial noticing activities, bring in those critical thinking skills and get children to get children to figure things out for themselves. So three columns, beginning, middle, end. As the teacher, you can read out the list of words and get the children to listen and decide where did I hear the sound? Was it at the beginning of the word? Was it in the middle? Was it at the end? And getting them to put the words into the columns as well. Practicing as much as we can on these noticing activities in the beginning in the international context is so fundamentally important. Uh, another activity that works really, really well in the online context that's come from the teacher's book is simple things like true or false. So we're working on our specific sound. Let's say we're speaking about the sound. I say a word. If you hear the sound, thumbs up. If you don't hear the word, thumbs down. And this works really, really well with similar sounds and identifying those sounds. So if you're working with s, then you might put a few sh words in there. You might put a few z words in there. And just to check the parameters of that sound, allowing the children to start noticing when a sound moves from one to another. So when we're moving from a s to a sh, when we're moving from a s to a z, can they hear that difference? And spending time on these noticing activities allows us to get their attention absolutely focused. Um, another great activity for noticing within phonics is doing simple things like, oop, Rhino, next slide, an odd one out activity. Now, you can make this as challenging as you want to. Go crazy. And the more sounds and the more letters, and the further through the synthetic phonics process that you have gone with your class, the more you can bring in and introduce. But this is a very, very simple odd one out. So I, as the teacher, will pop three pictures up on my screen. Maybe if I'm teaching on Zoom, I might put it in my Zoom background so that I am within the image, brings that focus outside of the teacher's face a little bit. And I will simply ask the children, I want you to look at these pictures and tell me what's the odd one out. 
So, children, what's the odd one out? Which word does not fit? Which is the correct answer? Alien. Boom. Lovely. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Georgelina, this is even better. When you say Martian, it definitely doesn't fit. Brilliant. Why? <laughs> Why? Why is the best teacher question in the world? <laughs> we, we ask them to identify, number one, we bring our critical thinking skills in. Oh, Carla, I love that phrasing. It's not a smiling A. <laughs> so nice. It's an A and not an A. Ah. So we've got ant, we've got apple. They're spelt with the same grapheme, but they're pronounced differently. Yeah. And as I say, when we are when we are practicing these activities, when we're working with these games in the classroom, take that little step further. So when they get comfortable, bring another step in, bring in. You can do the same game with ending sounds. You can give extra scaffolding. You can take information away. Um, you know, it's easier for the children to do this visually with the images as we've done here. If I put the words, it would be even more difficult for them if I put the written form. So take that next step. Um, yes, indeed. So exactly. They're able then to notice that different graphemes do different jobs. OK. Oh, did I do that? Amazing. Um, so, yes, as I said, increase the number of different items. Add to the odd group. You can add in a couple more and turn it into a sorting game. So you might have um, ant, apple, alien and agent, maybe. And they have to organize them into groups rather than just identifying the one that's different. And of course, you can use them in matching games as well. So turn them into little flashcards, make their own sets, get them to print them out at home and play some Pelmanisms or matching games as an extension to this activity as well. OK, <gasps> right. Who am I? What am I doing? What's happening? I have got control back of my computer. Rhino may have a break now. So. Um, Chants are another great method for noticing activities and chants are the easiest thing in the world to create in your classroom. They are so simple that once you teach the children the tricks, you can just get them to create their own. Um, step one to creating chants is organizing your words into groups. So you're going to pick a sound that we're practicing, or it might be a collection of sounds that we're practicing if we're reviewing. Um, once again here, I'm going to use that sound. And we simply organize our words into groups of numbers of syllables. So one syllable words, two syllable words, usually enough for a chant. Um, make yourself a list of age appropriate vocabulary with one or two syllables. Nice and easy. We've got that. Then we remember that musically, unless we're doing a waltz and we don't use waltz for chants, a, a typical rhythm will have four beats in a bar. One, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four could be four one syllable words. It could be two two syllable words. It could be three one syllable words and a clap. And that's what I'm sorry. Was that really loud on the microphone? If it was, I apologize. <laughs> um, I think I clapped a little too close to my mic there. So what I've gone for here is a simple pattern of one, two, three, clap. I like to add beats, claps, movements when it comes to um, practicing different sounds and working on noticing with different sounds. So I've taken my words and I've made a beach theme because always remember to teach in context. If we can, let's put those words all from the same theme. And then what I've created is a simple chant about the beach. So 
sun, sea, sand, sun, sea, sand, four, four. And I've got two two syllable words repeated, swimming, swimming, sun, sea, sand. And simply getting our children to practice these things, that repetition of those specific sounds, the positioning of the mouth and also the added rhythm and fun brings in that motivational aspect to it. Adding in beats, adding in claps, adding in movement, changing your speed, your volume, your pitch to add variety. So can we do it in a loud voice? Can we do it in a quiet voice? Can we do it really quickly? Can we do it slowly? How can we change that? Can we go high? Can we go low? And practicing and playing with things in a different word. So in an international context, just to summarize this whole section, make sure you are spending as much time as you can on that modeling, on that noticing. Modeling, of course, is an incredibly important part of phonics. You as the teacher are the you're the goal. You're what we're aiming for. Um, have a look at the picture on your screen. Can anyone tell me what sound this woman is making? You've probably got a 50-50 chance of getting this right. Yeah, there we go. It's a f or a v. It's a f or a v. Which one could it be? We need a little more information. From the position of the mouth, f v. We know it's one of those. What we don't know is what's happening here. It's a f. And um, modeling and talking about different sounds and different positions within the mouth is an incredibly important part of getting that first step to phonics right, learning those sounds and letters, um, especially if it's a sound that is unfamiliar within your language. Um, so what you'll notice here, these, um, this is something really, really nice about snappy sounds as well, which I like. They have videos, they have photographs, and they have descriptions for making each of the sounds, um, which demonstrates to the children. So if you, as a teacher, are, you know, if you have sounds that you have difficulty with, I, for example, used to find it really, really difficult to say a r sound. And there are still some other sounds within English that I sometimes stumble over. It's nice to have a bit of backup. This is always a useful tool if you want something within your class to show and demonstrate. But getting children to think about what happens. So uh, someone mentioned the smiling A. And that's because our mouth smiles when we make the A sound talking about these things, coming back to the jargon aspect and being able to talk about what we're doing within the classroom is incredibly important. Um, when we talk about the positioning, when we're doing our modeling, we need to be talking about the shape of our lips, where our tongue is, what our teeth are doing, whether there is a vibration, so is the, vo is the sound voiced or unvoiced, or in a young learner's classroom, we might just call them loud and quiet sounds. Is it a long sound? Is it a short sound? We need to be able to explain these things. And within the classroom, I thoroughly encourage talking about the sounds and how we make them. Now, once we have mastered the individual sounds and letters within a synthetic phonics program, we start blending them together to make words. Um, another reason why sat pin is used as the system, there are a lot of words we can make out of those six letters. And these will be some of the first words that are introduced within language. We start to move towards mastering reading and writing. And of course, once we have heard and said the new sounds, we need to start reading and writing those new graphemes. Um, within snappy sounds and within synthetic phonics in general, children are taught to form the new grapheme in a number of different ways, um, allowing them some form of control and manipulation within that 
is is great um, and I will thoroughly encourage in a moment as many different tactile ways of doing it as possible but some of the suggestions that um, the work really really well is things like air writing so getting children to write words in the air you can watch their fingers on screen um, here I am writing my own name so I'm making a C I'm making an H I'm making an A and an R, writing with your finger in the air. Also encouraging them to follow along and trace in their book as well. Mini chalkboards, whiteboards, sand and foam trays, anything that you can get your finger into to practice tracing those letters out and playing with them. Um, some teachers swear by rice. I've never tried rice. I'm, I'm a sand girl myself. But um, anything that they can play with, that they can touch, that they can manipulate to make those changes and practice forming those graphemes. And of course, moving from those individual graphemes towards the development of writing and spelling through word formation and dictation as well. Let's have a look at some of these different ways. So um, a few little tricks on here, which are great for developing the written and the reading within um, phonics instruction. Uh, the can cane using dots and lines to indicate where the length of the sound is. So a dot is a short sound um, and, and that line represents the long sound, the dash. So I might give my children a list of written words and they have to decide is that sound a long or a short sound in the word, pop the dots in for me. Um, you'll notice the image of the sheep. This is a um, wonderful little tool. So children see the picture, we say to the children, what is this? They say sheep. And we say, brilliant, can you write the graphemes in the boxes? And they have three boxes underneath. So how do we write those sounds? And the first box contains sh, the grapheme for the sound sh, which in this case is a sh. In the middle, they've got their double e for the e sound. And at the end, they put their p for the sheep, there we are, for the p sound. Now, um, I know many, many people, when they're first introduced to phonics, can often become slightly confused by the difference between graphemes and letters. Um, there are only three boxes to write sheep in. This is because sheep only has three graphemes. And the easy thing to remember, you count the number of sounds in the word and that will tell you how many graphemes it has. It might have five letters, but it only has three graphemes. And this is a great visual indicator. So if you are working um, to decode a word, this is an encoding activity where they're trying to write it down. But if we're doing it as a decoding activity, all I need to do is I don't put the columns, I don't make the boxes, I just have the word sheep written underneath and I ask the children to break it into the three graphemes. So there we go, we can work with that. Um, cookie cutters and Play-Doh every single time, um, using, using things like Play-Doh to form letters, to create letters, and as we mentioned earlier, using uh, some form of manipulative for writing in. So this word here, fun, is written on a black board in shaving foam, which is always a nice little tactile thing to play with in the classroom and pretty cheap to do. And it's something that you can encourage parents to do at home as well. So, you know, if you wanna help your child practice your writing, get a bottle of shaving foam, spray it onto a plate and have them tracing different graphemes and letters in that foam, wiping it clean and starting again. Great way to practice. Um, 
as we move from those individual graphemes up to word formation, as I said, lots and lots of different things that we can do. Um, this is a lovely little game that I like to play in my classroom, which involves having small um, grapheme cards. And the challenge of the game is we start with one word and by changing one letter, we need to make a new word. So I, as the teacher, will choose what graphemes I want to include, pop them in the order, make sure we've got those cards, have them all out in a line, and the children can choose one to change. So student A might take it from swap to swam, changing the P at the end to an M to make a new word. Swam might become slam. And um, this is a really nice way of encouraging practice of certain problems that exist from L1 translation. So you'll notice here, I have made the decision to practice our S blends. An S blend is bread and butter for English speakers. We love our S plus another, com uh, another consonant combinations. So our SW, our SK, our SL. Um, but of course, for a native Spanish speaker, S blends, they don't come naturally. We stick extra vowel sounds in there. Um, we might stick a, a vowel sound at the beginning. It doesn't say a swap, it's a swap. So it can really be a great opportunity to focus on individual um, transference issues that might occur from first language. In, in, in Saudi Arabia, for example, we would do oh, <laughs> intrusive schwas, indeed, Claudia, <laughs> exactly. Um, we do have one or two of those for native Spanish speakers. Also a problem for native Turkish speakers. Native Arabic speakers have problems with the P and the B sound. So, you know, depending on where in the world you're teaching, you'll find that you need to put extra focus on specific things. If the majority of your learners are first language Spanish speakers, then you're probably going to need to do a little more work on your S blends than you will on your P, B differentiation. So yes, um, use these activities to practice those key moments as you're coming along. What were we saying? Now, of course, English is a language where we discover many, many words that potentially are not decodable or at least not decodable yet. Um, as, as, we, as we would call them in the phonics world, they're sight words. They're the words we just have to learn to recognize and say. Um, in, in children's conversational language, according to snappy sounds, we talk about the, high, tip, the tricky high frequency words, the difficult words. Now, as you can see, um, depending on where in the phonics process you are, some of those high frequency words that are tricky, some of the words that are sight words at level one will not be sight words anymore by level four. It might just be that they have to be sight words because they're very high frequency and we haven't learned to decode them yet. Um, later on, that decoding might happen. So when we're working with sight words, um, as much as possible, put them into games, get through the practice in that, word walls, use them in your chants. So, you know, we've got the word I in here. It's a one syllable word. Um, we've got the word have at level four. So, you know, um, we, might, we might start changing our our chance a little bit. So instead of shout, uh, instead of saying sun see sand clap, we might have I see sun, I see sand swimming, swimming, etc., and change up our chance to include those tricky high frequency words as well. As much as it is possible, we can decode 
non-decodable sight words, but only to an extent. So for example, by the time um, you have finished week one of snappy sounds, a child will have met the p and the t graphemes that we see in the word put. What they don't know is the u in the middle makes an u uh sound in this word. So we can ask them, okay, you know this one, you know this one. What sound does this represent? P. What sound does this represent? T. Okay, so this word is put. We can decode the bits that they can decode as much as possible. And of course, how do we get better at reading? We read. So this brings us to the final point of my, my little phonics session today decodable readers. I am sure that those of you that do teach phonics in your school have a set of decodable readers in front of you and decodable readers, they can be, if I'm honest, they can be bad. <laughs> um, it, it, it comes back to what I'm saying about the, the idea that phonics was developed for native speakers. They often have very low frequency words that the children in a, in a multilingual or bilingual or international classroom probably don't know, definitely won't use. And often they, they lack meaning. So in terms of what you need to do to get the most out of a decodable reader, you need to start by getting a good one. What makes a good decodable reader? They should follow, number one, follow the synthetic phonics process. So just as synthetic phonics acquisition is a gradual systematic process, you should see that same gradual systematic process in the story that you are reading. Um, and it should include lots and lots and lots of practice, of course. A decodable reader should only use words that can be decoded. And the most common high frequency sight words that make sense. The language sense that comes from those common high frequency sight words plus words that can be decoded. If you've got a good decodable reader in your hands, your child should be able to decode everything within it. As I've said, in an international context, one of the key things that we're looking for is that it makes sense, that it has meaning and that it is engaging. It's not just about making the sounds. We're also simultaneously increasing our comprehension and our understanding of the English language. So if the book that you're reading is decodable, but doesn't make sense, how are the children in our classes going to understand it? However, <laughs> that being said, if you really want your decodable reader to be decoded, then there's two things that we need to remember. The images and the pictures should not encourage children to guess what's happening. They shouldn't be highly predictable and neither should the text. We want it to make sense. We want there to be some element of predictability, but we also don't want them guessing the words on the page. We need to ensure that they are decoding and reading. So there's a very, very fine balance for the teacher to identify there. And of course, the, the vocabulary should be age appropriate. It should be context appropriate as well. No words that the children are not going to use. Only things that will be useful in their language. Now, once you've found yourself a good set of decodable readers, um, the set of decodable readers I'm using here are the snappy sounds ones. Um, I like them. As I've said, they have lots of opportunity and support for second language learners, which in an international context is amazing. They also have a mixture of fiction and nonfiction, which is rare in a phonics series. And they are also incredibly age appropriate 
and they will connect to all other areas of education that the children at that stage are going through. Once we've got our great decodable reader, what we need to do is use it as a reader. So everything that we talked about in our first session equally applies to working with decodable readers, whether you're working in the classroom or as guided or group reading, we can still use all of those same hints and techniques that we would use with any storybook in the classroom. Before reading, we will spend time discussing the cover, um, predicting what's happening, using our Bloom's taxonomy of questions to create amazing questions for our students to answer. We will then open up our books and we'll do a little bit of pre-work with our vocabulary. And as you can see here in the Snappy Sounds Decodable Readers, we've got practice for saying the sounds, we've got an introduction to the new words that they will meet which practices all of the sounds and you'll also notice that some of the snappy words some of the decodable words are underlined these are words that are encouraged to really pre-teach the meaning because at this age they are probably unfamiliar but they are useful so you know you'll spend time in the classroom just as you would with any book going okay does anybody know what grazing is let's have a look this sheep is grazing what's it doing eating brilliant okay grazing eating grass fantastic you know we'll spend the time teaching that language as well as practicing the pronunciation and decoding those words You'll also see that you've got time to work with those tricky high frequency words, which they should be familiar with, but it gives you that opportunity to sense check it. As we read, we'll do it in the same way we would do anything. So you might get students to take turns if you're in the class, they could read those pages out loud. If you're doing group work, they might read the pages together, encouraging you to record. And as we said, this is so much easier online. Um, remembering to sound out and blend those new words. And of course, as teachers, regularly checking comprehension. So as you can see here, you know, you've got the visual support. We're talking about waves. The waves are hidden behind the text box. So you'll need to check that concept. They can't guess the word, but we can look and we can find it afterwards. Um, of course, Post reading, we've got all of those post reading techniques that we will use with any book. So as you can see, um, this one has built in comprehension questions, which is again, fairly rare for a decoded reader, but also a very useful tool for us as teachers. We don't need to think of things. So we can work through those comprehension questions and we can also revisit and practice sounding out those words, meaning that we're not only checking the, um, the reading fluency and the decoding skills, but we're also checking those comprehension skills, making it a fully well-rounded reading process, not just a, a practice of decoding. It's a book which has meaning, which I can understand. Okay. We have had a very long morning. Um, I have got about five minutes where I can take any questions that you might have. And then I'm going to hand you over to the absolutely wonderful Mariela, who is based out in Argentina and who is a wonderful, wonderful instructor. But if you do have any questions, I've got about five minutes to answer them. So go. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Let me see. Hey, yes. Oh, thank you, Mariana. It's been a pleasure to sit with you all today. And thank you so much for giving up your Saturday morning. This. Um, and thank you again, Silvana, for inviting us along to do this. It's been wonderful. It's always nice to speak with teachers who are so uh, dedicated to what they're doing and so brilliantly engaged in the session as well. It's impossible to do a great webinar without the support and the help of the audience. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lots and lots of thank yous, no questions. Um, if you do have further questions after the sessions, 
I will pop this information up here and the wonderful Mariella Burani will tell us now how you can reach out to Macmillan and what you can do to help. Mariella, my darling, over to you. Thanks, Charlotte. So nice to see you. Thanks a lot. It was wonderful. Thanks for your presentations. Uh, hi, Bob, again. Right. Okay. Well, as Charlotte said, hello, everyone. I'm Mariela Burani, and I'm a Macmillan Education International Consultant um, here in, in Argentina. I was going to say Rosario because that's where I live. Uh, it was a pleasure to have both Charlotte and Bob and such wonderful presentations, so insightful. I really hope they prove useful for your classes, for all the teachers. And thanks, Royna and Amanda, our team in the United, K United Kingdom. Thanks, Juliana, in our local office for all the organization. And special thanks, of course, to ESARP for having so willingly accepted uh, this idea of a webinar exclusive for members. Thank you, uh, Silvana. And uh, of course, thanks to all of you for attending and participating on a Saturday morning for us. Morning. Uh, we know we are all very busy and this year is being uh, pretty wearing, uh, so we really appreciate it. <laughs> And as Charlotte said, if you need further information on any of the series uh, mentioned, talk about text, snap sounds, or math science, or any other material, please feel free to contact uh, to contact us. You can see my contact details in the slide. Just drop us an email, and we can send you some of the material or whatever information you need. So I don't know, Bob. Do you want? Well, I'd just like to, to uh, say thank you very much, Mariella, and thanks, Charlotte. Um, thank you for listening, everyone. I've redrawn my graph. <laughs> I've redrawn my Great. graph so that it's easier <laughs> to see with the axis. Uh, and, uh, and I'd like to say that good luck to all of the teachers um, with, their, with their language, uh, their phonics, their graphemes, their science, and uh, their professional career. And I hope that we manage to speak to each other again. We ho I hope so that. Yes, I hope so that as well. Okay, so well, let's call it a day. Thanks again to everyone. Have a nice weekend. And I hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye.